Looking to fast forward your practice goals? Commonwealth Financial Network can help you evolve your business by providing entrepreneurial capital, affiliation flexibility, and tailored business strategies. Everything you need to put your practice into the fast lane. Welcome to a better path to success. Welcome to Commonwealth. To learn more, visit Commonwealth.com. Commonwealth Financial Network is a member of FINRA, SIPC, a registered investment advisor. Hi, I'm Suzanne Syracuse. Welcome to my podcast focused on the future, keys to building a profitable, sustainable, and impactful business. And I'm excited to be partnering with wealthmanagement.com on this. This series will focus on what firms need to embrace to ensure their growth and success for the future. And you'll hear from industry leaders and advisors on what is working for them. The content is directed at firms that are already successful and looking to stay that way, and also for those who are focused on taking their firms to that next level. I have a great lineup of guests in store, and today I'm talking with JC Abo Saeed. JC is the CEO and president of Halbert Hargrove, a wealth management firm with approximately $3 billion in AUM that prioritizes their client advisor relationship by ensuring a personal and comprehensive environment. Well, welcome, JC. Thank you so much for being here today, and I'm so looking forward to speaking with you. Oh, thank you for having me, Susan. This is exciting. Looking forward to the discussion. Yes, me too. And to set the stage for our discussion today, first tell us a little bit about your journey into the wealth management industry because it is not traditional. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, I was born and raised in Colombia, South America, and uh, I came to the country looking to get a master's degree in 1990. And there was I think uh, serendipity, for whatever reason, I ended up interviewing with Russ Hill, our chairman, uh, executive chairman and founder of the firm 27 years ago, and he's mentored me all the way here. I think what was unique about what happened, it's a collision. I call it a collision. I, I ran into a firm that was a diamond in the rough. The culture was amazing. And then what the potential, the business model just opened my eyes. And I think Russ saw how much I appreciated that. And anyway, that's how I got here. Now we did, when I started, we had 200 million under management, about seven employees. My focus was IT, operations, trading. That remained my focus. Eventually, I, as I moved up through the firm, I took over uh, chief compliance officer, COO, but again, I was never a financial person. What I mean by that, it, I'm not like a investment guru. I am in the investment committee of the firm, but th that's just not what I do. I'm not the guy that people come to for new ideas and new concepts in the investment world. And interestingly, as well, I'm not a client-facing person, so I'm not an advisor. I was never an advisor, and yet Russ gave me a path kept teaching me, kept mentoring me, and here I am, a CEO of the firm. That's amazing. I want to ask something. You know, um, I interviewed uh, Heather Fortner not too long ago, the CEO of Signature FD, and she also came up the operations and compliance path. Um, so I, I always think it's really interesting to see those that can transition from that type of more internal role to the CEO and president. But I do have a question. You said you were getting your master's and then you um, connect it with Russ. How did you guys meet? How did you, did they have a job opening? Like how did that, that originally, how did you guys originally connect? Oh, Suzanne, that's interesting. So the reality is I, I had a friend of mine that I worked with before he saw what I was, I, what I was able to do, uh, mm -hmm. and he didn't want me. I, to be honest with you, I had a job in Florida, and I was leaving California. This is 1996, and my friend called me and said, "You cannot leave. You're going to work with me. I'm not letting you go." This is a bank that's about three blocks from Hal the Hargrove, and for whatever reason, they did not allow him to hire me. So he was desperate. He didn't want me to go to Florida. And I, I, I told him my house is for sale. I'm leaving. 
leave me alone. I'm stressed. I have so many <laughs> things to do. And then he, he asked me to call Russ. And I called Russ. I called him six times. On the sixth time, he literally hang up on me. He didn't know why I was calling him. And then my buddy said, okay, you need to make an appointment at this restaurant. This is his favorite place. And so I did. And he finally took the bait, I guess. Uh, and the rest is history, I guess. The rest is history. Yes, yes, yes. I love that. I think that that is, uh, there's always so many interesting stories. There could be an entire podcast just on how people got into this business because it's very, very rare it to, to be very, very traditional. So thanks for sharing that. And that's just like, it's also persistence that there was a uh, fate involved of you not leaving California, which you still are in California. So, um, well, that's, and I think we're all better for, for you be, to be part of the the wealth management industry. So thanks for sharing that story. You know, one of um, switching gears, one of the most important areas when we talk a lot about this on, on the podcast for firms to focus on is having the right people in the right roles, loving what they do. But that's easier said than done. So what critical lessons have you learned over the years in your role on how to build a team that sets both the firm and the people at the firm up for success? Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. So I attribute the success of the firm to being fearless about hiring smart people and then provide them with a growth roadmap and a lot of education. And I think we've repeated that over and over. And then importantly, we don't add fences. We don't add a wall around them to keep them in the firm. Uh, we do the opposite. We make sure they get exposed to all aspects. They know what the competition's doing. They know what the industry doing, is doing as well. And then I would say we also focus on creating a safe environment. And when I say safe, it's an environment where they're free to share their ideas, where they're not afraid to voice their opinions, um, where there's purposeful collaboration and it becomes kind of a natural thing that starts happening with the firm. And then importantly, I call it dynamic mentoring, which is, by the way, what I got from Russ, but then... It, in a way, we've perfected it or documented it better. But the idea is, and I have a couple of examples of that uh, to paint the picture. So right now, the firm, I'm the CEO, and we have two ladies that are in the C-suite spot helping me run the firm, and they're doing incredible. So let me talk about their their path or their story a little bit. So... The first one is Cecilia Williams. She is right now our COO and chief compliance officer. There's a little bit of a repeat with her story in mind, but hers is better, I think. She started as a trader for us. We gave her a lot of education, so she got her CFP, this decided to pursue her MBA, and she was in a trajectory to become an advisor, and she did. She was one of her best advisors, and she came to me and said that being in front of clients and advising was not her passion. She wanted to go back to the management track, and specifically, she pursued to be our chief compliance officer. So fast forward today, she manages the majority of our wealth advisors. She's younger than most of them. She's still our chief compliance officer obviously CEO. And I mean, her, her, her career tra trajectory is incredible and there's no, there's no limit really for what she can accomplish. So how do you handle when you have someone that is really doing a great job at a specific role and they come to you and say, ah, uh, this isn't my thing. Like, or do you say, wait a minute, you're so good at it. Like, no, you got to stay and, and stay the course. What happens when somebody throws you that curveball? It's scary. It a test. It's a test to your culture. I would say I can sit here today and tell you that we, we immediately engage with the person and listen and, and we'll create a new path for them with confidence. I tell you, when Cecilia did this, I was like, just, you know, 
pulling the little hair I have left on my head going like, how, how do we, how do we reverse or how do we change gears and go in a different direction? But that we, but we've, we've learned that that's the right thing, that, that there's huge dividends when you adjust and change. And we, we keep doing it. We, we did it just recently last year, we moved one of our lead advisors into a position, an overhead position, where their their focus is going to be to be our our CIO. He's our co CIO right now. So we, we we keep doing the same thing, but you're absolutely right, and it's it's scary, but it's the right thing. You know that in the long run, it'll pay huge dividends. Yes, I can only imagine. And then you said there was another woman who's um, who was doing another type of role than what she's doing now is that also correct yes and, and her story was more i would say growing with the firm but very similar so it's kelly keenly she's a managing director of growth and the client experience she joined the firm in a junior position position as a client service manager with time she perfected that job and she started asking for more responsibility eventually she became the manager of the client service managers for the firm then took over the client experience. She started building workflows and standardization and the, and the service side of the business. That wasn't enough. She kept coming to me, challenging me. I really thought I was going to lose her because she had this energy and was so task oriented and project oriented. So she took over marketing. She redid our website. And now she she's now engaging also with the sales side of the firm. We're not a sales organization. We're trying to become one. And and that is becoming her forte now. That's great. Those are great examples, too, of how just making sure that you have an open door policy, that there's a communication. Because, by the way, there's a lot of times that in many firms and with many leaders that those two women or whoever it would be would have just left because they didn't like the role that they were in. They wouldn't have felt comfortable to go to the person running the organization saying, I like being here, but I want to do something a little bit different. Can you find a fit for me? And I think that that's great testament to leadership. So one area that I think many struggle with when it comes to being a leader, whether you're a leader of a team, a department, or a firm, is dealing with conflict. Most people don't like to or want to address difficult situations or conversations and end up doing the worst thing, which is ignoring it. So what advice do you have around this, JC? You are, you know, a, a, a fantastic leader and have really built teams almost your entire career. So I'm sure you've had to deal with conflict one or two times. What advice do you have for our listeners around that? Thank you, Suzanne. Yeah, the conflict was always been around uh, day one. So I call conflict the killer of culture and productivity. People that work with me know that I'm passionate about immediately addressing it. And you're right, but it's so easy. It's human nature, right? Procrastinate. Let's let's just see if it goes away on its own. But we don't do that. We 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 drive to resolve it. It's about being honest, being transparent, uh, dealing with the issues, seeking why the conflict is coming up. But we found, and this is uh, many years working in the firm and building the team that we have, it's when you have unifying measures, when you document job descriptions, when when you have clarity on roles and people know their li- their lanes and they stay there, when, when everything's aligned and, you, and again, there's clear communication and consistent communication, it does tend to reduce the amount of conflict. There's always going to be conflict. By the way, no no different than what we just spoke about. Somebody wants to do something different. That's that's a moment uh, where there could be conflict and it's how well you respond. And like you said, it's open door. It's people's ability to feel safe about voicing what is it that they have an issue with and and allowing us to step in and work, work with them and solve the issue. Yeah, so I I agree and I feel like, you know, when you when you avoid situations completely, while it may seem easier to not address it, 
what that turns into inevitably is a toxic culture, which is what I think you were alluding to. And I know just from my many years in leading a team, sometimes if things didn't get taken care of, they they spiraled into a much bigger scene or much bigger scenario. So the lesson is make sure you address it head on, make sure you're telling your your leaders and your managers to address things head on. And I think one of the ways to do that, right, is to have this open communication. That's the that's the best way to avoid conflict, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's so For critical. Sure. And you were you were saying it's a culture killer. Um you know, with there's such an enhanced lens on the importance of culture at a firm, not just in our industry, but in in general, right? So what are some examples of what you're doing at your firm to create a culture in which team members can really bring their true selves to work? Sure. So like I said, when I walked into Hal the Hargrove, I did pick up. Culture was very strong. And yet, what I found was that it wasn't very well documented. So one of my recommendations for anybody trying to build a culture is document it. Don't let perfection get in the way of getting that done. So commit it to paper. Make sure everybody understands it's go- it's going to be something. It's a do- it's a life document. It's going to continue to evolve. The culture is going to continue to evolve. It has to evolve with as the firm grows. And so, so, who owns that? Who owns the creation of that document? Right? Is that you? Is that um, your marketing lead? Your communications lead? Is it a group effort? How do you actually put that in writing? So, so that was uh, that's a great question, Suzanne. So. People say that I own it and that it, from Russ, it got passed on to me and that I it, it was me. But but the reality, Kelly is the most passionate person about our culture. And she's been the champion and she wouldn't let go. She was she wanted us to document it and she wanted us to work on it. And she she knew it, it was a forte or strong suit. And she made sure we started talking about it and celebrating it. And yeah. so do you have that, you know, mission, vision, like is the culture, your culture commitment written down somewhere publicly, or is it a document that the, you know, ele- executive leadership team sees? No, it it is a public document. It's embedded in our strategy. And then we, we keep reinforcing it. So as an example, right now, Our average tenure for people is 12 years for the firm. So we're 45 employees, average tenure is 12. And yet Cecilia recently announced at one of our big meetings, she said, you know, 20% of our workforce has been hired in the last three years. Hmm. So we, that opened our eyes. We're like, oh my gosh, uh, we need to get our culture into them. This is, reading a little bit about it is not enough. There has to be more. So over the years, we're, we're that kind of firm that reads a lot of books and we we do a quasi book clubs. But right now with, with these newer associates, we're purposely working on a, on a book. It's the culture code, which has helped us over the years. And we're using it as a way to infuse our culture to this new cohort. And that's one of the ways we, we, we keep it going. But then we, we read the book and like I said, it's like a book club and we go over the, the things that have happened to the firm over the years and, and why we do things the way we do and where it came from and why and all of that. So that's how it all comes together. What's the biggest takeaway from the culture code that you, that's really been like, uh, you know, a game changer for you guys? I, I use the word fearless. So the idea of addressing things head on, not letting things fester. And there's a little bit of the the feeling safe or making all associates associates feeling safe, but it's demonstrating the 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 culture, Suzanne. So it, you get tested. The more again, it's a fearless thing. The more you document it, the more transparent you are and and everybody's watching. So for example, we we say associates come first. Well, that that gets tested almost daily. Mm-hmm. 
if you have a bad, I'm not going to call it a bad client, but a client that doesn't see the value in the relationship or has unreasonable expectations, and it's a high revenue client, imagine the conflict that that creates when the team is obviously aware that this is not a good fit and perhaps it's time to part ways with that relationship. Well, right? It doesn't inherit. That's our business. It's a high revenue client. And we're, we're now getting tested. Are you are you willing to part ways with that client? Are you willing to have a fearless conversation with that client or not? And then we celebrate it when that fearless conversation happens, whether the relationship gets fixed or, or the client has to go. We, we celebrate it in a way of we, we dissect what happened. We make sure we understand what was it that we fail to do early on to fix it or what were the signs early on that would have maybe hinted at this is not going to be a good fit so let's let's learn from that and do it right yeah those are great examples um have you had to fire a client i know there's michael kitsis does a ton of articles around when it's time to fire a client and how hard that is right if they're really not your niche or maybe they're not your right culture or they're not treating your your staff and your team very well, but they bring in a lot of money, right? It's balancing that, you know, risk reward. Have you had to do that? Have you had to fire a client? We have, we have yeah. definitely. And, and it's been celebrated over the years. What, what's amazing, by the way, you know, firms get better as the years go by. We all know that we, we're, we're better processes, better technology, better advisors, you name it. But specifically, I think right now in, in every team that I work with and, and as we evaluate the, the the mix of clients, we celebrate that we have, we're, we're getting better and better at selecting, self-selecting both ways, right? Clients are selecting us, we're selecting them. So we don't have, uh, we, we, we have a great mixture of clients right now. But yes, we've over the years, definitely we have, we have parted ways with clients. And again, we we make sure, this is the key, by the way, about culture. You have to talk about it. it it'd be, it's, a, it's a big shame. If you miss the opportunity to at a staff meeting or a sales meeting, talk about a client that you have to part ways with, that's a moment. That, that That's part of the building of your culture. You celebrate that moment. And again, you're not celebrating that you, you, you a client left. You're celebrating that you were willing to deal with it and that you put your associates first and that you're 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 living your culture you're not it's not just words you you mean it i love that i think that's so important to really like talk about that and show that you're that you're choosing the people that you work with every day over money essentially really if it comes down Absolutely. to it and i do think that's important i think that's going to be even more important for the talent that's walking in to this industry in the future, right? Like that's going to become way more important than it even is now. Um, so, yeah. so speaking about just the client demands, et cetera, like as investor demographics and demands are changing significantly, right? What do you believe firms and advisors need to do to capture their interest and their loyalty to become forever clients? What have you really seen work at Halbert Hargrove? I want to start with our discovery process. And it's different in that one, it, its core focus is that it's not easy to dig out long term goals and translate them into financial terms for many people. So I'm not talking about for advisors, I'm talking for our clients or the people that come to the firm seeking advice. So our process is academically proven. And it's based on communication processes that were developed for cancer patients dealing with physicians. So the analogy is physicians and advisors. In both industries, we use highly te technical terms and nomenclature. So sometimes there's a lot of things that are missing translation. So the key is that also that some of the goals are top of mind, but they're the tip of that iceberg, meaning there's deeper, there's deeper goals, there's aspirations that are not yet manifesting themselves in, in, in those high level goals. So, so what we do, we do an interview. The discovery process starts with a one-sided interview where we're asking all the questions. We're not offering solutions. We're really asking questions of our clients. 
a lot of a lot of information is gathered from that. But what what's different about it is it's done over the phone. So we're eliminating nonverbal cues and biases. In addition to that, and this is the key, this is a little bit of that fearless that is part of the firm. It is done by the most junior person in the firm, highly trained to do the, the interview, by the way, but but they're the person with the least amount of financial and advising knowledge. Again, the the, the focus is eliminate eliminate that bias, right? The the that you know already how to solve for that. So you're not going to keep digging deeper into the into the issue itself. So so that's something that that I think is different. And then, yeah, and what and and two questions on that. First of all, what a great experience for that junior member of your team to be able to be charged with such an important piece of information and collection to further uh, develop out that relationship, right? You know, they're not just doing you know manual or menial tasks. They're they're really being able to to get in there and learn a lot about. The client relationship. So that's that's one thing. The second thing is who came up with the discovery process? Like who who did that and who like kind of owns that responsibility, knowing that the junior members of your team actually conduct it, but then who owns that piece? Uh, Kelly, Kelly again. We it, it by the way, it all came. We were at a at a conference and there was this doctor talking about the, the, he was doing the analogy of physicians and, and advisors and how it, it's really hard to for the end user to really understand what the heck is going on. And then it, there were several of us, but Kelly definitely saw it clicked on her. She saw the connection and jumped all over it. It was very hard to implement. Uh, you can imagine uh, advices are typically type A. They want to have control. Uh, there's your precious lead and you're going to put it through the most junior member of the team. That that could be a scary proposition, but we, we we pulled it off, and the the training is very very disciplined, and it takes a while for somebody to be able to conduct those phone calls. Yeah, that's uh, again, I think great. What kind of feedback do you get from those junior team members after they've done a couple? Are they do they really feel like it helps them in their training to become advisors? Absolutely, Susanna. Not all not all the people that end up being or the associates that go through this training end up being uh, wealth advisors. Sometimes they stay in a service position. But what 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 has been really special is they, they get to know the client inside out right from the beginning. And in fact, sometimes we do that discovery call. Let's say we have had a client for 20 years. Well, you, again, a lot of our younger associates haven't been around. So there's this very strong client relationship, but the, the team just doesn't feel the connection. So sometimes we, we put them through the discovery process again um just to Got make it. the team gets gets up to date and really really connects with what's going on with 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 those with those clients and their lives so that's a great example of some of the things that you're doing to implement to really capture the loyalty of clients and prospects what happens when you're what what what's another maybe example of of working directly with clients to keep them as you know, forever clients? Are there other things that you're offering that's unique that that really tends to go a long way with them? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, the, I life face investing. I'm very passionate about it. I come almost uh, my, my, my mouth can't work, uh, can't work as fast as I want. My brain is working and uh, trying to <laughs> tell you. So I'm a little bit excited about this. But uh, so life face investing, the idea is to view a client's life not based on their age, but rather their financial stage. And what typically, this is not no secret in the industry, you have the accumulation, we call that build and grow phase, the transition phase, and then the decumulation, we call it distribute and deploy. Again, we're using language that a typical person layman in layman terms can understand. So the industry uses predominantly uh, risk tolerance, and, and the age of the client to determine the asset allocation. We use the financial phase. Again, might not might not come across at first, at first pass, uh, very different, but we're looking at a proprietary flow chart that we've used and we're focusing on looking at the current assets 
versus future assets and the ratio between those two. So current versus future. Let me give you an idea. So uh, a good example of, of how this works. Assume you have a 30-year-old school teacher whose passion is really teaching. They're not seeking to become the principal of the school. They're not doing it because eventually they want to have a big check or, or a big income coming to them. They're doing it because that's their passion. But let's say they're lucky enough that they inherited $5 million. So when we're looking at this situation, we will we will treat them as somebody who's in transition or in a distributed and deployed accumulation uh, stage. And the, the reason why is because they're very unlikely over their career to accumulate that $5 million. So we're protecting them, even though they're 30 years old and maybe the risk questionnaire says they're willing to take a lot of risk, we will not take that approach. We will, we will seek to protect uh, that th those assets because, because of that ratio. So that's, that's a little different in how we do it. And by the way, we build different portfolios for each stage. So if you're in a build and grow, our portfolios have more risk embedded in them versus transition versus distribute and deploy and distribute deploy you you'll definitely have some income producing vehicles or more focused on that then in addition to that the wealth management aspect of it meaning the items that we focus on and the deliverables we're we're making sure we're we're executing on if it's somebody who is in the early stage they build and grow the accumulation we're going to we're going to seek to protect their income so we're going to look at making sure there's disability insurance, there's life insurance, anything else that, that protects that. Versus somebody perhaps that's in distributed and deployed, we're going to be focusing on legacy issues, state planning, tax planning, and, and so on. So it, it's, it's a whole ecosystem built around those stages. And then it gives our, uh, everybody a roadmap on what to focus. And I think that's that's definitely a differentiator for us. And we see it in clients. It adds a lot of value. It makes sense. It allows us to engage with the family, the, the you know, those sp disconnected spouses that are not really focused on, on what we do or the financial aspect of what we do by, by putting together this whole roadmap. It really, really helps to engage uh, that uninvolved spouse. Yeah, no, what a, that's, it, that's like a great example of really kind of looking at things a little bit differently of, and then just a, a way to engage, making sure all members of the household are a part of the financial discussion. So many times there's been so much written about, usually there's, there's one that takes the lead and, and the other it's, you know, many times hard to engage with them. So this sounds like a really good way to do that. So that's great. Those are great examples. Thank you for for sharing that. And I can't even believe it. This time has flown by because I love talking about these things. And, and I think our, our listeners, we've been getting a lot of traction on this podcast. These are really kind of important discussions to be having about really the future. How are you going to future proof your business? So we're on to the, the last question. I ask this question to every single person, every single guest. Um, the last line with the title and the theme of the podcast focused on the future keys to building a sustainable, profitable, and impactful business in mind. What is your last line? What key takeaway do you want to leave our audience with? Thank you, Suzanne. I say, find your North star, define it, draw a clear map and how to get there, share it, communicate it over it, rinse, repeat. Uh, you need to outline your mission, your value, your culture. And then again, you create that, that strategic plan with the long-term, the mid-term and the short-term, and you keep talking about it. You keep communicating with the team. You, you already mentioned it. You have to be aware of this next generation and what makes them click. And it's communication, it's trans being transparent, it's bringing everybody along. They need to feel they're part of the solution, they're part of the team, and that they have influence on the outcome of wherever we're heading. And of course, you add flexibility. This, the pandemic, the, the great uh, recession, they've taught us that you, you, you can't be stiff, you have to be flexible, and that's embedded in everything that I recommend uh, firms do and leaders do going forward. Uh, such great 
great points, great summary, great wrap up <laughs> too. that uh, on your last line. So many important things that next generation um, they are, are are looking at and thinking about things differently than the majority of the advisors um, and firm leaders in this business right now. And so we've got to, you know, be thinking about that. And that's one of the reasons that we put this podcast together, right? To really get people to start thinking about what's going to be successful in the future. So again, thank you so much for being my guest today, building great teams and creating a culture that really allows people to thrive is not easy. And I think you provided some amazing advice for our listeners today. So thank you for that. I'm Suzanne Syracuse. Thanks for listening. And I hope this episode leaves you feeling even more excited to be focused on the future. Looking to fast forward your practice goals? Commonwealth Financial Network can help you evolve your business by providing entrepreneurial capital, affiliation flexibility, and tailored business strategies, everything you need to put your practice into the fast lane. Welcome to a better path to success. Welcome to Commonwealth. To learn more, visit Commonwealth.com. Commonwealth Financial Network is a member of FINRA, SIPC, a registered investment advisor.